We begin tonight with an update to a story we first broke last night. Investigators believe a dispute over a vehicle being repossessed led to the shooting death of Most Lee Daniels in Aberdeen last night. Aberdeen police have arrested Lillian Kaysen or Quentin Smith. He speaks with police about the investigation. So, Quentin, this isn't her first run in with the law. It is not, Scott. In fact, Kaysen had simple assault charges pending against her prior to this murder charge that she's now facing. The 31-year-old was taken into custody not long after the shooting happened. Chief Henry Randall says this is a senseless act that he believes could have been avoided. I heard the gunshot and everything. It was outside this home on 609 Baptist Street where police found 39-year-old Mosley Daniels lying in the front yard shot to death. The street was blocked off, man. Cars was everywhere. Flashing light was everywhere. Nobody couldn't go nowhere. Nobody couldn't even move. Nearly 24 hours later, family and friends gather outside the home, still devastated over what they call a nightmare. It was just it's tragic, man. It was just sad, man. When tempers get involved and, you know, you have access to a weapon, that's what happens. Investigators say the shooter and suspect knew one another. Police Chief Henry Randall says it was an argument over a vehicle that led to the gunfire. From my understanding, uh, something about um, repossessions of a vehicle and one thing led to another. It basically got caught up in some he say, she say, and it just escalated out of control. Lillian Kaysen is the person accused of pulling the trigger. After she was arrested, Chief Randall says the 31-year-old confessed to the shooting. Investigators were also able to recover the weapon they believe was used in this crime. To me, I'll, just about any time you take a person's life based off of he say, she say, or an argument, uh, both family loses because now you got a you got a you got one in the family that has, is deceased, and then you got another one that's going to be probably sent off for a long time. Now, Casey appeared before a judge earlier today. Her bond is set at one hundred and fifty thousand dollars. Chief Randall says the case will now be presented to the district attorney's office. New tonight at 10, Starkville PD are looking for an armed robbery suspect. Police are looking to identify this man who robbed the Chevron gas station on the corner of Russell and Spring Street. The robbery happened last night just before 9 o'clock. The incident is still under investigation. If you have any information on this robbery, you're asked to call Starkville Police or the Golden Triangle Crime Stoppers. Emergency dispatchers are being recognized for their service and dedication. They're usually never seen, but when you have an emergency, they can make all the difference. National Public Safety Telecommunicators Week highlights those who take the role of directing emergency crews in order to get you as help, help as quick as possible. Our Stephanie Poole has more. When there's an emergency, dialing 911 is the first step that could save your life. And often we aren't recognized as first responders, but technically we are because we first take the initial call to send them out in the field. So just because we aren't in the field doesn't mean we're not first responders. We work three, six, five, seven days a week, so we never off. And sometimes we're on call, we have to come in. Ottibaha County E911 receive about 503,000 calls a year. Dispatchers deal with every type of emergency you can imagine, from fires to heart attacks to shootings. They've heard it all. People come in and think we're just answering the phone, and then when they sit in that hot seat, you have to multitask. You have to be a multitasker. You're talking on the radio to those responding units. If you're giving pre-arrival instructions, you're on the phone as with the caller as well. Um, you have the phone ringing. Um, you, you know relaying information to what's going on if things are changing. So you definitely have to be a multitasker. Just down the road in Ackerman, the setup is smaller, but the serious calls are the same. Anita Davis is the only person on duty this day. After 18 years on the job, sometimes she knows a caller and sometimes she knows a responder that's being sent to a dangerous situation. We dispatch that call. The officer responds and a lot of the times we don't know the outcome of that call. If we have a small child or if we, even if it's somebody that we know, maybe not closely, but if it's somebody that we know, we may never know what happens to that person. While they may not always know what happens after they hang up, they remain dedicated to keeping people safe in this stressful job. We keep up with them from the time we dispatch them until the time that they go back in service. These telecommunicators spend an average of 12 hours per day answering emergency calls. 
We definitely thank them for all their hard work. National Public Safety Telecommunicators Week wraps up on Saturday. Time now to get a first look at our forecast. We'll toss things over to Chief Meteorologist Keith Gibson. Hey there, Keith. Scott, right now, all quiet here in downtown Columbus. Things will be a little bit more active as we get into tomorrow afternoon and evening. We've had some clouds and some showers spotted around here, but uh, basically dry. Big time storms erupting out there across the high plains, Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas. Hail, wind, isolated tornadoes out there this evening. Tomorrow, our severe weather threat ramps up sometime after 2 o'clock. Highs will be in the 70s, winds will be from the south. But that chance for strong storms will be during the afternoon and early evening hours across the entire state of Mississippi and Alabama. Well, more on that system, Scott, in just a few minutes. Well, the state auditor is calling attention to the way your taxpayer dollars are being spent in Mississippi schools. It turns out that less than 60% of the total K-12 spending ends up going to the classrooms. Courtney Ann Jackson has a breakdown of the latest report. If you've ever wondered how the money for K-12 through schools gets divvied up, this latest auditor's report may surprise you. An analysis of the last decade reveals there are fewer teachers and students in the state, but outside the classroom spending has gone up. If we had held outside the classroom spending uh, the same per student as it was 10 years ago, we'd have another $358 million to play with to spend on whatever we wanted to right now. To put that into perspective, Shad White says that would have been enough for an $11,000 teacher pay raise. Part of my point of framing this as what we could have done in a teacher pay raise is to say, look, everybody knows how expensive this is. This right here represents real money. And it's money that was spent on administrative costs, everything from superintendent and district office spending to non-student transportation and information services. The responsibility is really on folks like me to talk about how this money is being spent. Uh, and, and my hope is I'm not, a, I'm not a legislator. I don't get to decide how the money is spent. But if we can shed some light on where the money goes, then maybe that stokes action either at the legislature or at the Mississippi Department of Education or at the local level to make sure these dollars are flowing where we want them to go, where parents want them to go. White also notes the failure to spend money inside the classroom may have had an impact on the state's ability to recruit and retain highly qualified teachers. Courtney Ann Jackson, WCBI News. When you're working with high school students, chemistry, chemistry that is, is pretty important. Our Educator of the Week, Dr. Bill Odom, knows how to get a reaction. Odom teaches biochemistry at the Mississippi School, school for Math and Science. He says the STEM fields can open doors and minds for students interested in a career in science, and he wants his students to be motivated to learn each day. I want them to love what they do. Um, it's important uh, to try to be happy and enjoy what you're doing for your vocation. Right. And um, do your best. They're right to begin with, and they want to learn more, and we want to give them more, push them to that edge. To nominate your favorite teacher, just visit our website, WCBI.com. If we do have some tornado warnings tomorrow afternoon, we will simulcast our coverage on these area radio stations, including 94.9 Nash FM and also WLSM out of Louisville. Hopefully we don't have to do that, but it is possible. We'll talk about the system next. WCBI's Educator of the Week is brought to you by Food Giant, where your neighbor WCBI first alert AccuWeather forecast with Chief Meteorologist Keith Gibson. Stop by Kroger in Columbus Saturday morning, 10 to noon. Pop up or pop a uh, weather radio into your Easter uh, supplies here as we get into the weekend. And uh, also Durham's Pharmacy Friday afternoon, 3.30 to 5.30 there in Vernon. So we are still in that mode of severe weather preparedness. Unfortunately, we have another one coming up tomorrow, another round of storms. Right now at Durham's in Vernon, all quiet here on our Wednesday evening. Same story, downtown Louisville, Mississippi. Looking back to the west, we'll probably have some pretty good lighting in the region tomorrow afternoon and evening. Some gusty storms, maybe some severe weather. But right now, no issues. Enjoy it. We are in the 60s, still a southerly breeze out there, passing clouds. The taller clouds are out here across the high plains. That's where all the color is. Tall clouds full of ice crystals, some of which are hailstones and some rain droplets here and thunder and lightning. Ongoing severe weather here in Texas, Oklahoma, Kansas. Hail, damaging wind, isolated tornadoes so far today out there. Now, as we put the Futurecast model into motion, we will advance 4 o'clock in the morning. No issues here. 
bigger storms back to the west. And as we roll on a little bit more so into the uh, late morning and early afternoon, uh, most of the action still to our southwest. This is still at 1 o'clock. So I think we're good through about 1 o'clock. Now all bets are off after then. We'll have this batch of showers and storms approach by 3 o'clock across the west. That will gradually shift to the east. This is 6 o'clock, a line of intense storms moving through uh, the Golden Triangle area, Tupelo, Starkville, Louisville. Within that could be some damaging wind, some isolated tornado potential if we can get a little couplet to spin on up and also some heavy rain, maybe a little bit of hail too. Uh, this is 8 o'clock and this along with several other pieces of information we've been looking at takes a good chunk of this, if not all of it out of here by 7 or 8 o'clock in the evening with residual showers tomorrow night into Friday morning and some wraparound showers here with a lot of clouds on Friday, breezy, chilly on Friday, temperatures mainly in the 50s here. So we have a changing air mass and with that change, we will have the chance for some severe weather, damaging wind, isolated tornadoes, a little bit of hail and several inches of rain again between about 2 p.m. and 8 p.m. Thursday. This is the greatest tornado potential where we are highlighting the brighter colors. That's actually along and south of Interstate 20 during the day tomorrow. We will have some up here, but some of the more robust ingredients could be just to our south. But having said that, this whole setup does favor a chance for at least some tornadoes in and around northeast Mississippi. So, of course, we will keep watching. A flash flood watch in effect for the entire part of northeast Mississippi. And there you have it, one to two plus inches of rain as we go throughout the day. Thursday, a uh, pretty quiet start to the day. Maybe a few spotty showers initially, uh, but by the afternoon, we'll have a better chance for some of those heavier storms. And as I mentioned, after 2 o'clock, the best chance for severe weather. Highs should get back into the 70s. Warmer in the southeast, cooler in the north west all because of the storms coming in first to the west but it's going to be pretty active tomorrow and still unsettled on friday a chilly day breezy cool 50s for highs mostly sunny saturday 69 easter sunday 78 tons of sunshine and still around 80 early next week local power providers are shining a light on how to save energy and money columbus light and water and tba joined forces to host free educational workshops Workshops include energy saving tips to lower those utility bills. Presenters also demonstrate how to use less energy on household items. Now the first 25 participants get to go home with a free home energy starter kit. It just gives you ideas on how to take care of your equipment, such as your HVAC, how to stop leaks and air gaps around your house, you know, simple things to keep your bill down. The last workshop is happening tomorrow at the Hyatt Place from 6 p.m. to 7 p.m. A former Indian finds her way back home. Tom has the latest on some off-the-court hoops moves later in sports. Welcome back, everyone. Spring has sprung, and so have those pesky spring allergies. We look at some of the biggest triggers in tonight's Health Talk with Baptist. What is the cause of most spring allergies? The biggest spring allergy trigger is pollen, tiny grains released into the air by trees, grasses, and weeds for the purpose of fertilizing other plants. When pollen grains get into the nose of someone who's allergic, they send the immune system into overdrive. As the trees start to bloom and the pollen is released into the atmosphere, allergy sufferers begin their annual ritual of sniffing and sneezing. Each year, 58 million Americans fall prey to seasonal allergic rhinitis, more commonly known as hay fever. Pollen can travel for miles, spreading a path of misery for allergy sufferers along the way. The higher the pollen count, the greater the misery. The pollen count measures the amount of allergens in the air in grains per cubic meter. You can find out the daily pollen count in your area by watching your local weather forecast. Here are some of the biggest spring allergy offenders. Trees including oak, pine, willow, elm, hickory, and cedar. Grasses and weeds including Bermuda, fescue, Johnson, perennial rye, timothy, and ragweed. Allergy symptoms tend to be particularly high on breezy days when the wind picks up pollen and carries it through the air. Rainy days, on the other hand, cause a drop in the pollen counts because the rain washes away the allergens. Join us next time on Health Talk with Baptist when we'll discuss some of the treatments of spring allergies. Mail your topic suggestions to Health Talk at WCBI.com. Health Talk has been brought to you by Baptist Memorial Hospital Golden Triangle. A West Point native and basketball star is returning home to play college basketball. The details on signing day coming up next in sports. BI Sports with Tom Apple. 
The man is coming home. Former West Point Green Wave standout Austin Crowley, gone for two years, returning to Mississippi. Crowley signing with Ole Miss on National Signing Day. The four-star recruit averaged 15 points per game at Sunrise Christian and was a McDonald's All-American nominee. Kermit Davis says Crowley will be an instant impact player for the Rebels. When you take the job at the University of Mississippi, obviously the first thing you think about is trying to sign the very best players in Mississippi. He's the best player in Mississippi. I know he plays in Kansas. Number one, I mean, he's from West Point. He comes from an unbelievable family. I mean, James and Amy are terrific. He's been coached at a high level, not only when he's at West Point, but at Sunrise Christian. And he's really talented. So he's going to have an immediate impact for our team next year. The top women's basketball prospect in Mississippi is also heading to Oxford. Pearl's Jayla Alexander signing to become a Rebel averaged 19 points, 7 boards, 7 assists, 6 steals while leading Pearl to a 6A state championship this past season. Coach Yolette McPhee McEwen saying Alexander is a key part to rebuilding the Rebels program. When I took over the job and I got with my staff, we thought it was important to really get the best talent to stay at home. And I think starting with Jayla and a couple other commits we've gotten in future classes, I'm really looking forward to keeping that, that in-state talent at home. A quiet signing day for Hale State Hoops, but the Bulldogs already got all they needed in the early period. Mississippi State signing five prospects, three of which ranked inside ESPN's top 100. The Bulldogs will be losing a ton of production next season, but head coach Vic Schaefer says this incoming class reminds him of another special group. Those kids remind me of Blair, Morgan, and Tory. I remember taking those three. We were in a car going somewhere on campus in the summer of their freshman year. And, and I remember Tori sitting in the back seat. She was back right behind me. She said, Coach, I just need to say this. I want you to know I don't care who's here. I don't care who starts. I'm here to play and take somebody's position. And they all chimed in. And that's the, that was the competitive spirit and nature of those kids as we all learned to love for four years. I think this group's got that same mental piece to them. Big day in Fulton as they welcome back one of their own. Itawamba AHS announcing Anna Porter as its newest girls basketball head coach. Porter leaves Tremont High where she was the head coach for three seasons, leading Tremont to the playoffs each year, plus a trip to Jackson in 2018. It's been 10 years since Porter played for the Indians, but she looks forward to building her own stomping grounds into a state power. I'm excited to get started. Um, I have a lot of pride in this school and a lot of pride, especially in that gym. Um, spent many years there and I'm excited to build this program and um, to see success. It's all about the kids and I want to see them succeed on and off the court as well. In high school football, Choctaw County has hired Water Valley defensive coordinator Jeff Roberts as the new man to lead the football program. Joel Coleman of the Starkville Daily was the first to report. Roberts spent six seasons with the Blue Devils, leading a defense that won the 3A state championship this past fall while giving up only 12 points per game. Signings from around the area, Starkville Lady Jacket star guard Jaleesa Outlaw is off to play D1 hoops. Outlaw signing with the University of Central Arkansas out of the Southland Conference. The All-State athlete averaged almost 18 points per game this year for the Starkville Lady Jackets and also leaves behind a state title legacy. Starkville showing out on the hoop side. Boys standout Jamarian Brown signs to continue his hoops career at Holmes Community College. Brown's was Brown was starting games dating back to his sophomore year and posted a career record of 83 and 10 while also winning the 2019 state championship. New Hope's Ryan McLaughlin signs to continue his baseball career with the MCC. McLaughlin has been sensational for the Trojans this year, batting nearly 400 with seven home runs and 29 RBIs while leading New Hope to a 17 and 5 record. That does it for sports. We'll have Alaska forecast coming up right after the break. In 24 hours, the storms will be done. Let's just say whether we are leading up to and during the event, Scott, will be fine. I'm sure we're going to make it through, but just be prepared. Cool, showery Friday. We are rewarded after a bunch of junk here recently, again on these weekends. Mm -hmm. A great weekend, Saturday, Sunday, your Easter weekend, no problems here. We just got to get through tomorrow evening and 
early night. There you go, and then we'll be home free for a while. All right, we'll gladly take mm -hmm. those to the sunny Easter and sunny week. Thanks, That's right. Thanks for watching, everyone. Have a great night. We'll see you back here tomorrow.